Hallelujah. Go with me, if you would, to the book of Proverbs. Stand to your feet this morning as well for the reading of God's Word. Hallelujah. We're going to go to Proverbs chapter 3. We're going to read verse 5 and 6. Two very, very familiar verses of Scripture today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways, and he shall direct thy paths. Amen. How many believe that this morning? Look at your neighbor this morning. Say, You got to trust. Come on, say it again. Say, You got to trust. You have got to trust, amen? Got to trust in the Lord. You've got to trust God, amen? Hallelujah. Just uh, shake your neighbor's hand this morning and, and, and feel free to be seated. Hallelujah. I want us to focus on four areas of this passage today. Trust, lean not, acknowledge, and then direction. How many believes if we'll trust, if we'll lean not, if we'll acknowledge Him, he will always bring direction. The first thing we all have to do is trust. This is the most important part of this passage, and everything else flows out of this. Trust in the Lord. I lean not to my own understanding. The reason I refuse to lean to my understanding is because I trust Him. Amen? I trust Him. I acknowledge Him in all my ways because I trust. I trust that He never leaves me. That He never forsakes me. He is with me always. Amen? He's with me even now. And I'm never in a place, I'm never in a position where God is not there. David said, if I went to the lowest hell, he would be there. Amen? And so I trust that. I acknowledge his presence in my life. Oh, you're not getting that this morning. Even when I'm running from him, even when I'm re rebelling against him, how many understand he's still with me? Amen? He's still with me. I, I can board a ship in, uh, uh, in Joppa and, 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 and run from the presence of God, run from the direction of God, run in disobedience to what God is telling me to do. But trust me, he's still with me. He's still there. Direction only comes when I trust. And when direction comes, I promise you, it won't make sense in the natural. Therefore, I must trust. Our problem is when we want direction, our problem is we want direction before we trust. And then we want that direction to make sense. In our natural minds. The direction God gives rarely ever makes sense. It seems impossible. If it was, if it was possible, I wouldn't need God. Amen? I want to title the message this morning, Whose Voice Will You Listen To? Whose voice will you listen to? 
Go with me to the book of Judges, chapter 6. And pastor made reference to this passage just a couple of weeks ago in our Wednesday night service. Matter of fact, much of what's being said this morning has been made reference to over the last several weeks on Wednesday night, and it's just kind of stuck in my spirit, and I, I wanted to minister around it this morning. Judges 6.36 says, And Gideon said unto God, If thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said, behold, I will put a fleece of wool in the in the floor, and if the dew be on the fleece only, and it be dry upon all the earth beside, then shall I know that thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said. And it was so, for he rose up early on the morrow and thrust the fleece together and wringed the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water. And Gideon said unto God, Let not thine anger be hot against me, and I will speak but this once. Let me prove, I pray thee, but this once with the fleece, let it now be dry only upon the fleece, and upon all the ground, let her be due. And God did so that night. For it was dry upon the fleece only, and there was dew all over the ground. Gideon puts out a fleece. He puts out a fleece to find direction. He puts out a fleece to find direction. Now, I, I've heard over my lifetime... I've heard a lot of preaching against fleeces. That's Old Testament, and, and that's not faith to put out a fleece. I've heard that preached many, many times. But the truth is, Gideon does not yet trust who's speaking to him. Think about that. Gideon does not yet trust who's speaking to him. We're in the book of Judges, and if you read about the Judges, and starting, uh, I guess it begins uh, with Joshua and, and flows right on through uh, to Samuel being the last judge, and when we get to Samuel, and Samuel is hearing a voice, he's hearing a voice, and he, he keeps running to, 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 to uh, Eli because he's hearing this voice, and, 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 and finally, Eli tells him to, to respond to the voice, Hear my I, send me. But the book of Samuel tells us that in those days, there was no open vision. There was no public revelation of God. <clears throat> when you read Judges, one of the main themes you see out, uh, you see it spoken over and over in the book of Judges uh, was uh, that there was no king. Oh, there was a king, all right. They just didn't know the king, amen? There was a king, all right. Uh, his name was God, amen? Uh, he, he had ruled over them. It was God that had brought them out of Egypt. It was God that had led them into this promised land. He was the king, uh, but, but uh, they, they were seeking a king because uh, all the world around them had kings and rulers. And Judges, one of the main themes through Judges, uh, the main messages through Judges is that every man is doing that which is right in his own sight. So, in Judges chapter 6, when the angel shows up, and Pastor Sadler is going to be ministering coming April on angels, possibly entertain angels. Come on, somebody. Gideon hears this angel, and, and keep in mind, I didn't read those passages but you can go back and read it. 
He calls Gideon a mighty man of valor, and he's hiding out in a cave, waving a white flag of surrender. He's hiding out because he's afraid of the Midianites. He's afraid. He's living in fear. And the angel shows up and calls him a mighty man of valor. Now, if you know you're everything but what you're being called, you tell me you're not going to question the voice that's talking to you. And Gideon is questioning that voice. Therefore, he puts out a fleece. There's no open vision, open revelation of God in his day. Everybody's doing that which is right in his own eyes. So Gideon puts out a fleece. He's hiding out in a cave, and he's being challenged to come out of that cave and go and fight the Midianites. So how important is it to know the voice of God in our life? Truth is, there are many voices in our lives. There's the voice of reason. Come on, somebody. There's the voice of doubt and fear. There's the voice of man. There's the voice of judgment. And many, many more voices. Satan used a familiar voice. The voice of Peter to try and discourage Jesus from doing the will of God. And Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. Because even though it looked like Peter, it sounded like Peter, it was not Peter doing the talking. Come on, somebody. And so, how important is it to know the voice of God? Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. It says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said, and he said, come on, he spoke. He spoke unto the woman. And he said, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened. Ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now, that first verse says the serpent was more subtle. You've heard me probably mention this before. The word subtle in Hebrew means to be sly, to be shrewd, to be cunning, and it carries another definition, to be sensible, to be sensible, to make good sense. To make good sense. What's the serpent doing in the garden? He's trying to reason. He's trying to, to make good sense with Eve. And it says here, and when the woman saw, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And then verse 8 says, And they heard the voice. And they heard the voice of the Lord God. They've already sinned. They've messed up. They've found themselves stripped from righteousness, stripped of righteousness. But in their sin, 
they still recognize a voice. In their sin, now in their messed up state, they recognize a voice. They heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife uh, hid themselves uh, from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said to him, Where art thou? Where art thou? Where art thou? To Elijah, he said, What doest thou here, Elijah? What doest thou here, Elijah? Remember this morning, I don't care where you're at. I don't care how far you stay. I don't care uh, uh, how far you've gone in the wrong direction. You can't outrun the voice of God in your life. If you've ever had an encounter with the real voice of God, you'll never forget his voice. You'll know his voice. Even deep in sin, you'll know his voice. The problem was not knowing his voice. It was the cloud of the other voice. It was the confusion that the other voice brought. That's what we see here. And Adam said, and I heard, and he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. And I hid myself. He never was afraid before when he heard the voice of God. But now he's afraid. He's afraid. Because he knows he's disobeyed that voice. And he said, who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree? Where have I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? You know, when you're away from God, when you're running from God, when you're in disobedience to God, how many understand the first thing he's going to do is deal with that? He's going to deal with that. What doest thou here, Elijah? God's going to deal with it. Because when you go and, and, and you read, and I, I'm not going to those passages uh, today, but when, you, for example, with Elijah, uh, when, when he prayed that there be no rain, through every one of those passages of Scripture, it says, and the word of the Lord came unto Elijah, and the word of the Lord came unto Elijah, and the word of the Lord Lord came unto Elijah, and the word of the Lord came unto Elijah. Elijah did this because it was the word of the Lord. Elijah did that because it was the word of the Lord. And now Elijah runs from Jezebel because all of a sudden there's a voice of fear in his, his mind. There's a voice of fear in his life, and he runs, but it was not from the direction of the Lord. And God shows up when he's hiding out in a cave, amen? And God's What's he doing? He's dealing with the voices he's listening to. What doest thou hear, Elijah? With Gideon, God has sent his angel. How many times have you spoken to an angel? You see, in our Wednesday night Bible study, we've been talking about the nine gifts of the Spirit. Three of them are definitely vocal gifts. The gift of tongues, the gift of interpretation, and the gift of prophecy. Vocal gifts. Many of the others can be vocal. The word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, come on. A word of discernment, could be a word of healing, could be a word of faith. Almost all of them have the ability to be vocal. We've talked about those gifts and how important the gift of discernment is. To be able to discern. There's a lot of voices around us. 
in the church, out of the church, in our family, on our job. There's a lot of people talking in the news, whether it be local or national. There's a lot of people. There's a lot of voices in our world. It's important to be able to discern in all of those people speaking what is the voice of God for your life? Can I be at home to our... If you're Sister Judy, and I, I don't know, I haven't talked to you personally to know exactly what the doctors diagnosed you with, if it's AFib or, or, or what, but I know my, my stepfather that went home to be with the Lord just a year ago had to have his heart shocked back into rhythm many, many times and, and was on a monitor and all, all of this stuff monitoring his heart. But when you hear the voices of all the specialists that have different diagnosis and different analysis of what is wrong with you, and, and you see the x-rays, and, and, and you, you hear the report from the CT scan, and all of this stuff, you better somewhere in the middle of all that be able to know and discern the voice of your God. You won't die of a heart problem. You'll die of fear. You'll die of torment. Of all, all the stuff you've been hearing. That's enough to mess anybody up. Judges chapter 7 verse 1 says, Then Jerubbabel who is Gideon and all the people that were with him rose up early, pitched beside the well of Herod, so that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill of Morah in the valley. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me uh, to give uh, the Midianites into their hands, uh, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me saying my own hand has saved me now therefore go to proclaim in the ears of the people saying whosoever is fearful and afraid let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead and there returned of the people twenty and two thousand and there remained ten thousand ten thousand ten thousand Anybody want to be Gideon right now? Anyone want to have an army of 32,000 and watch 22,000 walk away? And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people are, are yet too many. Bring them down unto the water, and I will try them for thee there. And it shall be that of whom I, I say unto now notice this. God is being very specific. He says, And it shall be that of whom I say unto thee, This shall go with thee, the same shall go with thee. And of whomsoever I say unto thee, This shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. So he brought down the people under the water. And the Lord said unto Gideon, Every one that lappeth of the water with his tongue as a dog lappeth, him shalt thou set by himself. Likewise, every one that boweth down upon his knees to drink. And the number of them that lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, were three hundred men. But all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. And the Lord said unto Gideon, By the three hundred men that... Now, who said to Gideon? Come on. Who said to Gideon? The thing you need to notice through all of this is God is speaking. God is speaking. God never ceases to speak. And, and the Lord said unto Gideon, By the 300 men that lapped will I save you. And I, by the 300 men that, that lapped water like a dog, that's what Scripture says. He, he says, By those 300, I'm going to save you. And deliver the Midianites into thine hand and let all the other people go every man unto his own place. Uh, come on. How many would have been like Gideon wanting to put out another fleece? How many would have been? Questioning the voice you're hearing. 
Maybe I need to think of something more difficult. Then a fleece seemed wet and the ground dry all around. And then the fleece being dry and the ground wet all around. You see, God never makes sense. He reduced an army from 32,000 to 300. To 300. Run those numbers. Make sense out of that. Nobody's sensible. Is it ever going to give you this direction? But that's just it. If it was possible with men, it wouldn't be God. His ways are not my ways. But his ways are higher than my ways. If you're waiting for God to make sense, you will be waiting a long, long time. God reduces an army from 32,000 to 300. Make sense out of that. Second Kings chapter.